there's a uh, famous TV preacher that recently tweeted out this advice. He said, don't waste time with people who don't appreciate what you have to offer. The people around you should celebrate who you are. He said, don't waste time with people who don't appreciate what you have to offer. The people around you should celebrate who you are. Well, that's just bad advice. Now, let's think about this. What if Jesus, and, and there was actually a comic strip, this is what in, in inspired this, uh, that I read a couple weeks ago, that had illustrated if, if Jesus had taken this preacher's advice, it would have been devastating. He would have skipped the cross altogether. If Jesus had not wasted his time with people who don't appreciate it, what he had to offer, he never would have died for our sins. He would have called upon his legions of angels and they would have swept in and take him, taken him off the cross. Because the Bible says that he died for us while we were his enemies. While we were still lost in our sin, Christ died for us. We didn't appreciate what he had to, what he had to offer. In fact, Isaiah said that we esteemed him not. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by, by God, the Bible says. So a word of caution, first of all, is, is often seemingly wise advice is not the wisdom of God. Often seemingly we, we hear advice and we hear a lot of things and, and, and daily. You, you'll probably, when you leave here before the end of the day, you may hear something that sounds good, but it's contrary to God's word. It's not the wisdom of God. Well, Romans 15 is an example of the wisdom of God. It's an example of something that flies in the face of, of what, this, what this preacher said that sounds good on the surface, but when you really think about it and how it's supposed to play out in the Christian's life, it's just not good advice. So the context, we've been reading Romans for what, 15 uh, weeks now. Uh, maybe a little bit more as we've uh, taken a break here and there. But Paul is, is preaching the gospel not to unbelievers, but this letter is written to Christians. Remember, it's Jews and Gentiles, Jewish and Gentile Christians, because God's word had been given to the Jews in the Old Testament, and now through Jesus Christ, the gospel, it, it's gone out to the Gentiles because God was never a racist. He meant to have Jews and Gentiles, everybody, people of all nations as one family of God. And so the gospel brings us all together and makes us the church and it, it's kind of like the it's kind of like the wizard of oz. You've got these people from different backgrounds, you know, you got the lion and the and the tin man and the and the scarecrow and Dorothy and you've got these people from different backgrounds but they're all on the same journey. And they've all got their own shortcomings, right? One was heartless, one needed a a, a brain, one needed courage and and Dorothy just wanted to to go home but they're all on this same yellow brick road headed towards the Emerald City that's what the church is like we're people from all different backgrounds and we've all got our shortcomings we've got our weaknesses but we're all in this together and we're all headed to the same place and we we best work together in unity if we're gonna get there and if we're gonna be pleasing to God you see, the problem is, is so the Jews had, had the law. They were given the law. To them was given the law and the, and the prophets and, and uh, the sacrificial system and, and uh, all the, the traditions and, and holidays and all those things were given to the Jews. Well, the Gentiles, I mean, they were all pagans. Those things weren't given to the other, the other nations. So... Oh, what happened was when Messiah came, when, when Jesus the Messiah came and he, he fulfilled the law, the Jews struggled letting go. I mean, can you imagine being 
being taught one way. It's like a person coming out of legalism. If you've come out of a legalistic church and you've been taught one way all of your life and then all of a sudden you start reading the Bible and you start realizing that not everything that, that man taught was lined up with God's Word. It, it, there's something about us, the way we're wired and programmed. It's, it, it, we have a hard time letting go of a lot of that stuff. I mean, we, we carry baggage around with us. And, and so there was Jewish Christians that had trouble letting go of some of their... Uh, traditions. Of course, the Gentiles didn't. I mean, they were outside of God's family, and now all of a sudden, hey, by God's grace, you are saved. Believe the gospel, repent of your sins, and, and believe upon Jesus, and you're saved. And they never had any law to, they were never pre-programmed to have to let go of something. So it was a lot easier for the Gentiles. So Paul, here, he's been talking about the weak. Not the, not the weak in faith towards towards Christ, period, but towards certain things in the, in the Christian life. And, and probably when he's talking about the weak in context, he's probably actually talking about the, what we would think of as the strong, the Jewish people. And, and when he talks about the strong, he's probably actually talking about the weak, the, the less knowledgeable, and in, in, in the Gentiles. You see, the weak wanted to observe the days that they were, they were freed from. Remember, all the Jewish holidays, the sacrificial system, the temple was fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. He is the high priest who, who brings us in uh, to God. Things like the Sabbath. We don't keep the Sabbath. Yeah, we may rest on Sundays. Well, first of all, the Sabbath was uh, originally on a Saturday. Okay, So unless you're not doing any work on a Saturday, you're not keeping the Sabbath. Well, the reason most Christians don't have a problem with this, there are some like the Seventh-day Adventists who, who insist that we keep the Sabbath, but the reason Christians don't is because we see Jesus as fulfilling our Sabbath rest, and our rest is fulfilled in, in Jesus. But there was Jewish uh, Christians who believed upon Christ who, who still saw it as a sin to not keep the Sabbath. And they also continued to... Uh, um, Avoid certain foods. Jews can't eat pork. Well, in Christ, he says nothing. Don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. And, and, and so some of the Jewish Christians uh, struggled eating pork. But rather than be selfish, Paul says that the Christians should welcome one another. And, and rather than despise and, and look down upon those who, who are weak, Paul says that you should, you should bear with them. In, in time, help them realize their freedoms in Christ, but, but, but put them above yourself. Don't sit there and just eat pork in front of them. Bear with them and, and love. Put them above yourself and, and bring them along in Christ. And, and for those who, who, who stayed away from things uh, and, and observed certain days, it says don't judge those who, who don't do it because they have the freedom in Christ. Don't judge one another and don't despise one another. So let's look at verses 1 through 7 here. Paul says, We who are strong, and he includes himself with the strong because although he, he was, Paul was Jewish and Gentile, he realized his freedoms in Christ. He said, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So, in other words, we have been freed in Jesus Christ. We have been set free in order to serve. We have been set free 
in order to serve. Kind of sounds like a contradiction. But Paul says we have an obligation. We have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So when he says we have an obligation, in other words, he's saying that that's not a suggestion. <laughs> you have an obligation to bear with one another. Why? Because we're, we're, we've been made part of God's family. We are, as a church, we are part of God's family. We're all members of one another. And two, uh, Jesus is the one who made us a part of God's family. And, and Jesus, he, as our forerunner, Jesus didn't take bad advice. And we've already discussed that. If he would have, he would have never died for our sins. Jesus didn't please himself. He bared with you and me as a sinner in order to bring you into the family. And he, he, he bears with you now, sinners, as we continue to work out our salvation in Christ. But at the same time, he calls you blessed. He calls you a saint. <laughs> There's a lot of confusion over this sinner and saint thing. Are we sinners or are we saints? Well, we're both. We're sinners, but because of God's grace, He calls us saints. We're not saints because we've uh, attained uh, a certain status, status, as the Catholics might say. We're called saints. The early Christians were called saints. So any of you here who believed upon Christ are, are called saints because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Because His righteousness by faith belongs to you. And though you are a sinner, He doesn't see your sin. Jesus did that for us because He served us. He came to serve us and do the will of God. And so we are obligated to do the same. We've been freed. We've been set free from our sin in order to serve others. Martin Luther said, A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. Then he says, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. This is how he explains it. He says, these two theses seem to contradict each other, but both are Paul's own statements. Who says in 1 Corinthians 9.19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all. And in Romans 13, 8, he says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. Love is, Martin Luther says, by its very nature, it is ready to serve and be subject to him who is loved. So Jesus says, what are we to do? What's the great commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we're seeking to do the will of God in everything that we do and to love your neighbor as yourself, to love other people. So the question is, are you ready to serve those whom you love? Paul goes on to talk about pleasing others for their good. We are called to please our neighbor. Paul calls us, he says that we are called to please our neighbor. Does this mean that we're people pleasers? I mean, he says, oh, so you're, you are to please people, but doesn't, doesn't other parts of Scripture say that we're not to please people? And, and both, both are true. It, it depends on how you look at people pleasing. You see, when we please people, it's for their good, for their ultimate good. You know, not giving people what they want, but giving people what they need. So we're to please them for their good. So that's not... That wouldn't be buying an alcoholic a, a six-pack of beer in order to please them. That's not, that's not the pleasing that, that Paul is referring to. It's not lying to a friend to make them uh, uh, like you or to imitate a, a, a friend or someone to make them accept you. That's not the people pleasing that the Bible is talking 
about. In fact, Jesus had very, uh, much to say in the Sermon on the Mount about people pleasing and how we shouldn't live for the applause of others because it can control us. A lot of our insecurities today are, are trying to please others. We're, we're trying to live for others, to get their applause, to, to make them like us. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's saying because we've been set free, we want to others to see the glory of God like we do. And that's what we live for. It's to please them for their good, to give them what they need. And not to cause strife and division among ourselves as the body of Christ. God does the same thing with us. So to please means to look out for each other and not for ourselves. You see, we are selfish as fallen people. Just like I said earlier, we're prone to leave the God we love. We're prone to wander on our own, but not in Christ. We have the Spirit of Christ dwelling within us. If you believe Christ is, is in you. And He gives us the power to not be selfish and not to put ourselves first, but to sacrificially live for other people. We are to bear with the weak, Paul says. So how are we as, as strong, and there's a sense all of us are to bear with, with one another, but, but how are we to bear with others. Well, first of all, for the strong, those of us who understand our Christian liberties, our, our Christian freedoms, we bear with one another in dealing with weaker Christians. Again, weak, weak isn't a, a, a derogatory term. It's not a bad term. It's just those who, who, who um, lack the understanding at this point of their Christian freedoms in Christ. They, they might not have as much understanding. Not that you're a better, more supreme Christian that they are. You just, simply by God's grace, you've got a better understanding in a certain area. So maybe there's a, maybe there's a convert from, maybe there's a recently uh, converted Christian who used to be Hindu. And we know to, to Hindus, the, the cow is sacred, and many of them don't, don't eat cow. Okay, and so maybe they're not worshiping, you know, uh, their gods anymore, but they still have a problem eating beef, and they're still struggling eating beef. Well, I wouldn't suggest that we, as as believers, go take them to Water Burger and enjoy a Water Burger in front of them. You know, it, it really. Looking over last week's chapter and into this week with the Christian liberties. Sometimes it's hard to make a good, good correlation between the context. You know, in every part of Scripture, you, you, you start in the first century, right? And the goal is, is to take us to the 21st century. So you've got to build a bridge between the people that Paul was talking to into the 21st century so we can apply it to our lives, so we can see how does this work in our lives, because everything in Scripture is relevant to us. It's just a matter of crossing the bridge and seeing how it applies to us and 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 with this 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 Christian liberty he was he was dealing with some specific issues you see the Jews Christ, Christianity our faith is an extension of Judaism uh, Jews worship the same God that we do it's, it's the only other religion that, that, that worships the same God that we do you can't say that about the Muslims worship Allah Hindus worship many gods and, 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 and so forth. But the Jews, we are, we are continu a continuation of the Jewish faith. But, but the problem with the Jewish faith is that they have denied the Messiah. They have denied Jesus as the Christ. Christ is Greek for the Hebrew term for Messiah. And so it's hard to find a perfect correlation in what he's talking about here because he's telling them to bear with the the, the weaknesses of the Jewish Christians who, who struggled in, in things pertaining to the law and what they have been set free from. The best one I can think of is, uh, like, we, like I talked about earlier, is, is um, uh, somebody from a legalistic background. If you've come out of a legalistic uh, church, 
or you were raised in a, in a legalistic church. You had a lot of man's rules and regulations. Maybe you had to wear your pants a certain length. Maybe, maybe women couldn't wear uh, makeup. Maybe women couldn't cut their hair. You know, back in the day, you know, some people couldn't watch TV, couldn't go to the movies and, and, and so forth. So, so things like that, when a new believer, so let's say a new believer comes out of that faith, and I'm not talking about somebody who knows what they're talking about. All right. If somebody tries to put you under a yoke, a legalistic preacher or somebody who's well along in their faith, and they're trying to put you under a heavy yoke, you tell them, no, I'm not doing it. I'm talking about somebody, somebody, let's say somebody comes into our church out of a legalistic background, and they're, they're, they're searching the scriptures, and they're listening to the messages, and they're uh, in community with you guys, and they're still struggling in some certain areas. It, 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 let's say it was a person who struggled going to the movies. Don't take them to a movie because according to last week when we were looking at last week, if they have a weak conscience and they think that that's a sin and you convince them to go to a movie on the spur of the moment and, and their conscience is weak, for them it will be a sin because we're both living to please God, right? We're living to please God and that person with a weak conscience who thinks this is wrong even though it's really not wrong and they go anyways against their conscience, they're going thinking they're displeasing God. So they are displeasing God. Because God wants us to live with hearts that burn for Him. At the same time, we can take our time and, and pray for them. And, and when we have time, talk with them and sh try and show them in the Scriptures how there's nothing wrong with going to a, a movie theater or you don't have to, women can wear, you know, skirts or, or whatever. You know, of course, we want to be modest. We don't, but, you know, women can wear makeup or whatever it may be. So that's, that's the best correlation I can, I can think of between uh, how this applied in, in, in Paul's day and how it applies to us today. Another example might be, uh, we talked about the age of the earth last week, that there's, there's, um, in-house debate in Christianity whether the the earth is is uh, is only 14,000 years ago and and it was it was made in six literal days and then others say no it was it was made in six long periods of time and the earth is is millions of years old and and we can have those discussions and I love having those uh, discussions and, and and that's that's fine and, and dandy but what if somebody really struggled what if somebody what if the door was open to them let's say they were a science-minded person and they read a book about this day-age theory which is perfectly within the context of scripture and God used that to to open the door to them uh, to receive Christ all right and then you come along and you're just like drawing a line in the sand and you're telling them no no the earth is is this old and 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 you're 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 putting an unnecessary obstacle in their way while they're still weak now when they're stronger in the faith because to me <laughs> it doesn't matter to me if they're you know if the earth was created in six literal days or if it was created in six long periods of time I mean I first of all I don't think that was the point of Genesis but but I'm strong in my faith. It's not going to make me stumble and, and fall. The point is, is we should be looking out. Our ultimate goal is to see us all matured in Christ. Let's all come to salvation and grow in our faith. The goal is to build people up. Another way we bear with the, with the weak is, is in seeking to save the lost. Don't put unnecessary obstacles between you and, and a lost a person, somebody who does not know Christ. Remember, our goal is to build them up. Paul says that that he, he his desire is that some of it is that he would win some of them. Some of them would be would be saved. And so sometimes that sometimes that can mean not being legalistic, <laughs> because we do tend to make up these man-made rules that aren't in Scripture, and lost people see that and they think. You know, th there's no reason to put an unnecessary obstacle that God never said between us and the lost. But on the other hand, sometimes it's not the same way of dealing with our weak brother or sister. It's not practicing our Christian liberties in front of them. Paul said he would become all things to all people in order to save them. 
He would become all things to all people. Now, you've got to understand that in context. He's not talking about the, the people pleasing that Jesus spoke against. In fact, Paul uh, would never uh, please somebody just to receive their applause. What he meant was if, if uh, there were certain instances where there's no way, you know, the, the Jews wanted the Gentiles to be circumcised in order to come to Christ. And, and Paul said, no, it's only by faith alone. But he took Timothy when they were going to preach the gospel to, um, to the Jews, who was half Jew, half Gentile. And even though he, he, he had uh, some Jewish descent in him, he didn't have to be circumcised. But he didn't want to put an unnecessary stumbling block between the gospel and the Jews. So he had Timothy circumcised. You see what I mean? And so to the, to the weak, he would become weak. To the strong, he would become strong. He would become all things to all people in order to win some of them. Being a loving, selfless servant involves careful thinking. If we're going to uh, obey this command to, to bear with one another and to love one another supremely over our Christian liberties, we've got to think through different situations. And, and I can't give you a black and white answer for every situation. You, it's going to be you and the Holy Spirit and thinking through these situations. Am I, in every situation, how can I love my brother or sister the most? Maybe you have the freedom to uh, drink alcohol and, and you realize that, that having a beer isn't going to send you to hell. It's, it's drunkenness that the Bible speaks about, not having a, a sip of a beer or, or, or wine. But maybe not every uh, uh, situation, not every case is, is uh, appropriate for you to practice your Christian freedom. There are certain situations where you may make others stumble. If we truly love one another, and we truly love other people, our desire is for their good, ultimately. Another way is to love those who are hurting, to bear them up. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you you took somebody's burden as your own. I mean, we do a lot of, you know, and, and I'm as guilty as anybody, but we do a lot of, you know, hey, I'll, pr I'll pray for you, and, and uh, if we don't forget to pray, maybe we'll say, <laughs> you know, maybe we'll say a quick prayer for them. But, but when was the last time you were up in the middle of the night, not because of yourself, you know, you realize we stress out and we get anxiety, but usually it's, it's, it's because of us, for ourselves, or you know, maybe our children or our spouses, but when was the last time you were up at night, you couldn't sleep because of somebody else? Because you were bearing the burdens of someone, someone else. That's how God, God wants us to love our neighbor as ourselves. When was the last time you wept with somebody who wept? When was the last time you were there for somebody, not to always do something. You guys, and, and I point out guys because we're the worst at this, you can't fix everything. <laughs> as much as we'd like to, we, we, we can't fix everything. And not everything's about fixing a problem. You know, sometimes people just need us to be there for them. Just to, I mean, just saying you love them, you know. Sometimes just a phone call to, to somebody and saying, hey, I'm, I'm here for you can mean the wor world to somebody. Send a text to somebody who you know is hurting. And man, when somebody's hurting and they lost a loved one, don't avoid them. We want to go, we get insecure and we're like, I don't know how to help, so the best thing to do is just stay away. No, that's not the best thing to do unless somebody's telling you to stay away. Now, don't bombard them because a lot of times we want to be alone. Other times we want people with us. But let somebody know you, you care. Drop a line to let somebody know that you care about them. We're to bear one another's burdens. Jesus was always involved with others. He was always involved. And so Paul gives us encouragement uh, from the scriptures. He quotes uh, Psalm 69. He says, the, reproach, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is our, our forerunner. Our example is, is Christ. And, and he quotes 
uh, uh, Jesus is saying the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. You see, Jesus came to do the will of God, not in selfishness, but in selflessness. He emptied himself because he was God and became one, in a, one of us in order to serve his Father. He denied himself in order to promote the welfare of others. He bared with his own disciples even, those who were under him. I mean, think about it. Jesus had to bear with his own uh, disciples. They, they had selfish ambition. They were worried about who's going to be the greatest. They never quite understood what he was trying to say uh, with their ignorance. They kept thinking that he was going to conquer like King David, and, and they kept wondering, hey, when are we going after Rome? When are we going after Caesar? When are we picking up the sword? And, and Jesus had to bear with them in their ignorance. And he continued towards the cross as people spat in his father's face. And then he died for them. So Paul quotes Psalm 69. And Paul says it was written for our instruction. The things that were written in the past were for our instruction. This was originally written by King David. David wrote this in a, in a time of anguish. I sent a text out to some of you guys this past week of, about this psalm. He, he wrote this in a time of, of, of anguish. And, 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 and David um, um, was hurting. And he said, The reproaches of those who reproached you, God, have fallen on me. But most, uh, there are several verses in Psalm 69 that were applied to Jesus in the, in the New Testament. And this is, this is one of them. Paul says that they were written that we might endure hardship, that we might be encouraged to keep walking like Jesus, and that we might have hope that we're, we're moving towards something, something greater, a greater purpose. So the goal here is that the church, that us as the body of Christ, as the people of God, would walk in unity. And so... In verses 6 and 7, Paul gives a, a blessing of, of empowerment for us to walk in unity together for the glory of God. He says that together, well, starting in verse 5, he says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Nothing glorifies God more than to see His church walking in unity. And that's what this letter is all about. That was Paul's purpose, is that these Jewish and Gentile Christians, they had been... Uh, there had been friction between the two. They had lacked some understanding, and Paul's trying to bring them... Uh, together by preaching the gospel to these Christians from different backgrounds. Nothing glorifies God more than the church walking in unity. And we do this by selflessly and sacrificially serving one another. And so verses 8 through 12 uh, talk about how Christ brought about this unity. He says, For I tell you that Jesus, well, that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. So Jesus became a, a, a servant to the circumcised. That means to the Jews, all right, because all the promises had been given to Abraham. They had been given to the Jews. And so he came to fulfill those promises. He was the Messiah that the scriptures had, talk and had talked about. But it doesn't stop there. It says, and in order to show that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And then he says, as it is written, and then he starts to quote several places in the Old Testament to show that it's not just about the Jews, it's about the, the Gentiles. So he quotes, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, and even he who arises 
to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. So the rest of the chapter touches on Paul's role, and we're not going to go into the details of the rest of the chapter. He starts wrapping it up, but it, it, it's basically talking about Paul's role in bringing unity, <laughs> his purpose for writing this letter. He says, man, you, the church is doing great in, in a lot of areas, but in some areas I've had to bring, bring correction and show you, show you the correct way. But hope frees us to serve. And so verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And, and Paul says these things a lot of times through Scripture. You know, he'll be writing Scripture and then he'll say a blessing or a, or a prayer. And so it's easily, we can easily pass over uh, these things. But this is a very powerful statement, and I encourage you to go back and really meditate on, on verse 13. Because when we, when we have hope, when we have hope, we are freed to serve others. What does hope mean? That means when salvation comes, when we receive Christ, we've been given everything and, and we've got eternity waiting for us. We've got a kingdom waiting for us. And so we're eternal and, and our destiny is set. Our, our retirement is, is, is set in stone by faith. And that's what we're hoping. When things get bad, when things get rough, that is our hope. And it's a guaranteed hope. It's, it's not a, oh, I hope so. It's, it's, it's knowing that our retirement is, is set and it's going to be... We can only imagine. <laughs> so when we realize this, the more we realize this, and, and, and we realize that our destiny is set. We're freed to, to serve others. And Paul says that when we have hope, that brings joy and peace. True joy and peace. Because nothing can come against you. And everything in this life is, is only temporary. And our insecurities begin to flee when we have hope. Because we are a part of something much greater. When we have hope, it frees us to love sacrificially. So I'm going to close and ask this. Do you have hope? Hope comes from faith, from believing. That's what Paul says, verse 13. Look at it. Believe that Jesus came to save you from your sin. Here's the thing. Repent and believe that Jesus came to save you from your sin. That means change your mind about sin. doesn't mean you become perfect, but change your mind about it. Have a change of heart about sin. Repent and believe that Jesus is Lord. It's easy for us to say Jesus is Lord, but is He your master? Lord means master, ruler. Is he, have you surrendered to Jesus as the Lord of your life? Because without Him, without Jesus, there is no hope. Do you have hope? Take that seriously. I don't care if you've been here since the beginning. I don't care if you've been a, you know, you've been a churchgoer for, for 20 years. Do you have hope? And if you do, we have an obligation to bear with one another. Not to seek our own comforts above others. You have an obligation. Let's be on a mission to change this world for Jesus. To put others first. And that doesn't happen by being, uh, being first in line. We don't have to be first in line. Does that make sense? We don't have to be first, first in line. 
when I was a little boy, I remember in, in elementary school, we would get in the water line and all the kids wanted to be first and they fought for that first place. Always wanted to be last. You know why? Because everybody who was in front of me, I knew that the teacher was going to be counting one, two, three, four, five, go. One, two, three, four, five, go. And they all had that temporary drink, but somehow I knew like if, if I was at the end of the line, yeah, I had to wait. <laughs> I had to be patient, but when it got my turn, a lot of times she was done counting and, and I could drink as long as I, long as I wanted. That's what the Christian life, I mean, we can spend it, we can waste it now, but we're on a mission. And, and what he's, he, he's calling us to do is, is be living sacrifices. I mean, we understand what it means to go serve in the military and, 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 and give ourselves as a sacrifice and to serve others and to serve our countries. It's the same, same principle in love. We have to make sacrifices as Christians. We have to put others above ourselves that is what life is all about it's not about living the american dream it's about serving others and i promise you you're like oh man this sounds like such a, a tough hard sacrifice and it is but when you do it you want that road to peace and joy go serve somebody go do something for somebody how many of you have, when you've done something how do you feel when you when you sacrificially done something for somebody else how does that make you feel inside Great, right? You feel wonderful. I bet some of your, your, your most joyous times is when you've been able to serve somebody else. Why? Because that's how God wired us to be. It's our purpose. It's to serve others for His glory. So continue to fight through the power of the Holy Spirit. Continue to fight all the temptations to be selfish and to serve ourselves and serve others. And we will find joy and peace that's given to us as a gift from God. Love like Christ and serve like Christ. Because when we love like Christ, it is, by definition, serving like Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and then I got one more song. I want.